In Saskatchewan, essential service means donuts. If you, as an individual, block people from getting Robin's donuts, you are a terrorist.
So hopefully the audio is going to be a little bit better now. Uh, I had it pointed to my old mic, unfortunately. Uh, and I'm just going to see here if I can quickly go like this. Uh, yeah, that's going to be a little bit better. OK. Now, without further ado, the song number two. The RIAA says I'm a thief because I download MP3s. Well, I got nothing but this hard drive space to lose. I tell you it's a fact if I had too much more, they'd take it away from me in court, claiming their actions protected their revenues. Well, they must think it's quite a joke, and it gets a lot of laughs from lots of folks. Seems like I downloaded my whole life through. Hell, I never even thought of it as wrong. Cause I'd buy more CDs after hearing more songs, I tell you. Had nothing to do with their revenue. Well, I grew up quick and I grew up leading. My hacking got hard and my wits got street. I'd roam back door to back door to hide my name. But I made a vow in the moon and stars that I searched the databases and the systems far and kill that connection before it got too lame. Well, just finished with the shell I had since July. I kissed my DSL connection goodbye. Battled around a security with Big Blue. Went to a cyber cafe in case they pulled the lugs. And there at the table, spewing foot, sat the dirty dog that protected the RIAA's revenue. Well, I knew that snake was a lawyer so bad from the way he jumped up and down so mad when they saw that Kaza light was installed on every PC in the room. He was big and bent and gray and old, and I looked at him. My blood ran cold, and I said, if you're defending your bands, how come all the money goes to you? I was so pissed off, I hit him between the eyes, and he went down. But to my surprise, he jumped right back up with a lawsuit in his hand. But I called right back, and I marked him a thief, and he forced the conversation out into the non-witness street. Acronym and in a cursing, I made my stand. I tell you, I stole my identities of tougher men, but I really can't remember when. He tricked like a snake, he brought out a pocket PC and filed. Another suit, he said I'd pay for this fuss. He went for his digital pen and initial first. He stood there looking at me, and I saw him smile. And he said, son, this world is rough, and if an association is going to make it, their legal got to be tough, and you know, to keep the music monopoly at long, we'll crush independence until they die, we'll overexpose until you buy, and from those sales, major labels go on strong. He said, now you just fought one hell of a fight, and I know you hate me there got the right to report me, and I wouldn't blame you if you do. But you ought to thank me, boy, before your case is tried, for the leading circles and the code and scales in your eye, because I'm the son of a bitch that forces you underground when I yell, Sue. I got all choked up, and I threw down my palm, and I thought about its crooked law, and I saw that every time it sued, it's true. My hacking gets better and my skills get leader every time I find a P to P that's sweeter. But in the end, whoever wins we all still lose. Cause the RIAA has got control over music, Congress, and America's soul. And if you want to copy, sample, or even use any music you bought and paid for without fail, You'll be fined or put in jail All in the name of their goddamn revenues Well, 
I think about them now every time I see a young coder writing stuff that's free. And if I ever have a son, I think I'm going to teach him. To fight the corporations from a legal and political standpoint so he won't have to hack. And to support free music with all his back. And maybe after a generation or two. Their greed will thin and freedom will win. Sampling songs won't be a sin. And we'll have taken and farmed all of their grounds to sue. Wow. That, that, is, that is, even so many years later, Kind of sends chills down my spine. And what's interesting is we are a generation later. That song was, I think it was 2001 that I found that song originally. And so the battle is still going on. And even back then, they knew that it was going to take a long time. Like this wasn't going to end easy. We weren't going to just solve all these problems of the RIA and the major labels like Sony and vertical integrated monopolies like Bell, they weren't just going to go away on their own. It was going to take the combined efforts of and sacrifices of many people over decades. And we're still in that struggle, including my work today. So in any case, I've got some really trippy uh, visual effects going on today. But the uh, what's particular, that is in particular notable for something that happened this week, but something that I want to talk about later. So perhaps we'll, we'll try to remember that song for next week or maybe the week after when I get to that point. But what, what I wanted to kind of talk about today is in the event that, of course, my, my guests didn't show up, which they didn't. <laughs> uh, well, actually, there's a couple of things. First of all, I wanted to mention that I've been kind of dog fooding on this in terms of like what I have been listening to over the past like three weeks or two weeks, not so much this week, but certainly the last two weeks has been this show to kind of get a sense for, is there something valuable in it? Like if, uh, is the sound quality so bad that you can't listen to it? Is the, little things like that, right? What, what could over the, the half of a year now that I've been doing this, have I exactly been creating? And so I, I just wanted to kind of point that out in that I am kind of looking back on it and trying to see, is there anything I can do better? Is there something that uh, is kind of emerging as a trend here? There are, there are a couple of things, but it, if you're wondering why I'm like bringing up music from like a decade or two decades ago, that is why, is because I, I really am interested in, in the, the show itself and trying to make it a better thing and kind of going from there. So, and, and by and large, I think, I, I, Personally, I enjoy it. So I don't know if you guys out there in the internet enjoy it, but it's, it's certainly meeting all of my expectations. So, of course, it could be better at meeting yours. Let me know. Give me some feedback. Jeffrey.cliff or jffrey.cliff at gmail.com or ricochet m s z i s n a f 7 b for q q p h for hotel r for romeo d for delta. And I'll certainly take things into account, especially if you have Creative Commons music. I'm always interested in playing new music. So, but enough about kind of the show. One of the things that I wanted to talk about last week, and I just sort of ran out of time, was the Anti-Terror Act of 2001. And so this was a bill that was passed back when the Liberals were still in power before the Harper government, the Krejcian government here in Canada. And, and my recording is not stopped. What happened to my recording? No recording. Lovely. We'll just... Uh, Wait a second for my recording to turn back on. There we go. Now we have recording again. Okay. And okay, there we go. So it was a tap, it was a law that was passed in the immediate aftermath of September 11th. So there was a terrorist attacks in the states. Everyone freaked out, and because everyone was freaking out, part of what was changing was the laws in Canada relating to well terrorism. And so it, it's it's hard to even get data on this bill anymore because so much has happened. And especially with under the heading terrorism, if you Google just you know anti-terror laws, there's been so many around the world and so many terrorist attacks. And every time there's a terrorist attack, pretty much you can bank that one of the things that lawmakers do is they jump on that chance to pass a bunch of laws that they couldn't otherwise have been able to pass because 
people would freak out about, oh, hey, should we be giving our government the ability to monitor all of our communications in real time? This was unthinkable in 2001. This was the stuff of like vi super villains in movies. And like, uh, the, I mean, the Soviet Union did that sort of thing, uh, but it would never happen in the free world out here in Canada and the States. Of course, I should probably not be messing around with my microphone. There we go, a little bit better. And so uh, it was It was one of those things that was passed, and uh, it was not passed without protest. And so one of the groups that was protesting this at the time was the Canadian Bar Association, an organization of lawyers who would that, you know have to defend clients against these sorts of things, and uh, were just generally concerned about the rule of law generally. And so there, there were like little bits and pieces where the rule of law was falling apart. But by and large, in 2001 in Canada, we were a country of laws. We were a country that had a strong Supreme Court. We had a country that had, uh, you know, the legislature, uh, executive branch that was kind of held in check by laws. We had all kinds of things. And they were kind of worried about some of the impacts of the Anti-Terror Act on things like the rule of law. And so one of the quotes that I kind of pulled out of, they, they had this report on C or on a C-36, the Anti-Terrorism Act at the time. And so it quotes a mission on Bill C-36, Anti-Terrorism Act 01-37, Canadian Bar Association, quote, the true measure of a society is how it treats the unpopular, the powerless, and the disadvantaged. And so what they were trying to kind of point out by that is that this was going to be used immediately these powers against the Muslim community in Canada. And just as in the States, there was something like 10,000 or 20,000 Muslims just swept up and arrested for no reason at all, other than that they were Muslim in the wrong area. There were similar attempts at doing sorts that sort of thing in Canada. So, quote, it was precisely at times such as these, i.e. right after the 9-11 attacks, that these, sorry, such as these, that those freedoms are potentially under greatest assault. We recall during World War I the internment of Canadians of Ukrainian origin, and in World War II the internment of Canadians of Japanese origin, and the confiscation of their property. Of course, in 1970, the War Measures Act invoked and or was invoked, and 400 Quebecers were arrested without any evidence, incarcerated for several weeks, and then released. That's right. So in Canada's history, we have made mistakes. And what happens is something happens in the world, like World War I, where people freak out about it. Uh, and then one of the things they do is they find someone to blame. They find someone in their community who's an, somehow related to the, 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 the people who did the, the bad thing elsewhere in the world, uh, or even in the case of 2015 in Canada, uh, who are just superficially related. Like there's lots of problems with Islam, but w the problem with Islam is not that all Muslims are terrorists, for example. And yet that is the sort of thing, especially if we go back in history just a little bit, just to the, the First World War, we had interned just people who, because they were Ukrainian. And I mean, knowing enough Ukrainians here in Saskatoon, like Saskatoon's got a lot of Ukrainians in it, and like they're freaking harmless, like they're hardworking, <laughs> you know, the, the normal people here. And so like the idea of just like locking them all up in camps or something, it's absurd now, but we did it. And we could very well do it again. And the way that that sort of thing happens is, again, something like a World War One or 9-11 happens, and then politicians freak out, and then our freedoms are taken away. And this is what happened in 2001, is we had a, a terrorist attack and the politicians freaked out. So, quote, uh, it is also notable that, quote, uh, at the time, the NDP was the only party to say, no, this is not acceptable. This is an abuse of power. The Liberals supported it. The Bloc supported it. The CRAP, or the Conservative Reform Alliance Party, the precursor to the modern day PPC and CPC, voted for it. They were all in favor of just like taking a wrecking ball to our ancient freedoms and just pushing forward with this law to do all these terrible things, which I'm going to get into. So, quote, and this is from uh, Sven Robinson as part of the Open Parliament. Open Parliament has a, a thread that was the debate of about this. And so he made the point that, quote, certainly the internment of Canadians of Japanese origin was popular. The proclamation of the War Measures Act was very popular. However, there were both profoundly wrong. And that's another point, which is that when politicians freak out, a lot of the time it's because it's within, it's popular for them to do so. It's, it's, they've got the backing of their citizens. 
uh, to, to engage in that kind of freak out, that level of freak out. When people were freaking out about terrorism post 9-11, politicians had backing. There were plenty of people who were afraid and didn't know what to do and were just like looking for an excuse to do something, to allow politicians to do something. And so this is what we got. So one of the things that Bill C-36 was supposed to do, and probably in fact did do, was it, it was intended to ratify and implement some existing treaties that Canada had signed that at the time that they were signed, they were kind of like obscure, not really newsworthy, not certainly not dinner table newsworthy treaties that countries around the world, again, a terrorist attack would happen, and then some country would take it to the UN that something has to be done. And so the countries at the UN would have their long discussions and eventually come to, to some treaty that they would agree on. And it really didn't impact most people. Like most people are not terrorists. So when you see that there's this financial crimes and terrorism treaty going on and signed in Geneva or wherever, or New York or something, you're not really going to care if you're someone living in Canada in the 1990s. It's just not relevant to your life. And so there were all these treaties kind of stacked up and Canada implemented some of them and not implemented others. And C-36 was supposed to like bring Canada up to date with the, the current status quo of what people had agreed to, bureaucrats had agreed to, uh, without really much feedback. There was probably a little bit of feedback from Canadian citizens who were kind of keeners and interested in this sort of thing. But it was it implemented these treaties anyway. And so one of the things that 9-11 was treated as was it was treated as an attack on NATO. And NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is basically an organization of a bunch of countries that was designed to protect, well, maybe not protect, but protect, attack, whatever, form an alliance against the Soviet Union post-World War II, right? And so this was treated as if it was an attack. And what how NATO works is if any of the countries are attacked, all of the countries have to attack in response. And that's how it works. And so that, that was invoked. And so Canada, by being a member of NATO, had to do something. Again, we're back to the politician syllogism where it's like, we have to do something, taking a wrecking ball to our freedoms is something, therefore we have to do that. But regardless, that was what how this came into be. And so it's worth pointing this out because NATO really has had some negative consequences being a member of NATO. And sure, there's probably some positive consequences too, but it's worth also considering that this, this came from NATO. So when we start thinking of fixing the problem by getting rid of these anti-terror acts and laws, one of the things we should also think about doing is leaving NATO. Because if we're in NATO, we're exposed to the risk of this sort of thing happening again, even if we can fix it, which of course is going to take a while. It's important to consider the, here's another uh, quote from, I think it's the report, quote, it's important to consider the legal tools already in place to combat terrorism before enacting new laws and in the process of enacting new laws to ensure that existing mechanisms function effectively. And then that report lists like a dozen laws that Canada had already ratified uh, or already put into law against terrorism. So, quote, acts of violence, hijacking, etc., are already illegal circa 2001. You can be denied entry into Canada on a whim have your photos and fingerprints taken at the border, be subject to a seven day arrest without review, already totally fine. Your detention is justified purely on suspicion. I, you're a Muslim, therefore I don't feel comfortable about you coming into the country, therefore you're arrested for seven days, done. Like that was already as what was on the books and already available to law enforcement and border officials in Canada. This was not something that had to be added to. Uh, Quote, the minister can if issue a certificate that results in immediate detention of a foreign national in Canada pending federal court review of the certificate. The court and minister can rely on evidence not disclosed to the foreign national, i.e. they can uh, arrest you, uh, hold you, and not even tell you why at all. And, quote, permanent residents can be also subject to a certificate and detention with re or with or detention with detention re review by an adjudicator. I, there's some oversight there, but long story short is they don't have to even tell you what you're charged with. It's just like you are suspicious. Therefore, we're going to arrest you and hold you without trial for seven days. And even if you're a PR, still, we're not going to tell you why. We're not going to give you allow you to challenge the evidence in court. Nothing. You're just like seven days done. Now, there is some need for the government to be able to do something like this. 
to in case there is not necessarily for seven days, but like there, there is room wiggle room for the laws that were already on the books circa 2001 to, you know, we could argue about those, but even still, uh, that was a lot of power in the hands of the government to just, or, and the officials to just be able to, you know, using stereotypes or whatever, just arrest you without trial or without charge. And so like, for example, if you're a PR and uh, you're taking part in a protest or you sign the wrong petition, maybe here I am going door to door and there are people with permanent residence who are not citizens who are signing the petition that I'm going door to door with. And could CSIS have access to the petition? Of course they're going to get access to the petition because it's going to be in the, the House of Commons. And, and so like, would that be an excuse to just go up and arrest everyone? It could very well be. But um, anyway, continuing on, quote, a suspected rep terrorist cannot make a refugee claim. This is already current law in 2001 and cannot avoid removal to a country of persecution, i.e. if you are a, let's say you're from Saudi Arabia, right? Like let's say you're a woman in Saudi Arabia and you are about to, and you've converted to atheism. So you're gonna go back to Saudi Arabia and they're gonna either rape you or kill you, probably both. And you come here and you're a suspected terrorist. Again, suspected terrorist, not proven terrorist, not evidence against you. This is a mm, lick my finger, put it on the, file, you look like a Muslim, uh, you're going back to Saudi Arabia and you're going to be killed. Even though normally under Canadian law, we don't allow people to be sent back to a country where they're uh, going to persecute you, where they're going to kill you, whether you're going to be about to be tortured. That's the sort of thing our laws are supposed to protect against. Have we got peanut gallery comments? By the way, if you are watching this on Facebook, you want to leave a comment, feel free. Feedback is always good. But anyway, this is, again, all stuff that you could do before 2001. So. Quote, the, the Canadian Bar Association recommends that the federal government make a concerted commitment to funding law enforcement agencies, intelligence gathering agencies, and the military to levels that allow the full use of existing law enforcement tools for the protection of national security and public safety. I.e., at the time, there was a whole, well, the, the liberals had been in power for a while, and they had chronically underfunded the military. And so the military was becoming the joke that it eventually became in terms of having to like beg other militaries for ammunition during things like the war in Afghanistan, doing things like having helicopters that didn't work, having ships that didn't work, uh, not really having fighter jets that were modern at all, et cetera, et cetera. Like the military was underfunded, but the police were also underfunded to the extent that the federal government was involved. And so there was, and, and this actually ha goes way back. Like if you go back even like to the 30s, all the way back, there have been really, really powerful laws on the books and uh, laws on the books that allow police in Canada to do all sorts of crazy things. But they are continually hampered in solving crimes by their available resources. And so they, they could solve a lot, a lot more crimes and have a lot more stability in our neighborhoods, like, for example, alphabet soup, but they have a lot of stuff to do. And so there, there's one of the balancing acts here is here in Canada is that we could have a more of a police state because the laws are already, even before 2001, we're already ready for such a thing. But the, one of the things holding that back was just the lack of funds and the lack of police time. And so places like Thunder Bay, where like there's only so many police officers and how many of them are at the hospital babysitting drunks and how many of them are dealing with domestic abuse cases and stuff like that. So when you we're talking about a response to terrorism, when our police departments are already maxed out, they're not ready for something happening, a, a big thing where a lot of people die and having to deal with that sort of situation. That was the real situation in 2001. And so when the, the Canadian Bar Association says, okay, there are ways to, to deal with this, this threat of terrorism, however low and irrelevant to our lives it mostly is, the number one thing is to just fund law enforcement a little bit more. And that solves the problem without taking away our, our basic rights. So anyway, continuing, Canadian civil liberties did not believe they had sufficient time to study the implications of the Anti-Terror Act, which is another uh, thing worth pointing out, is that the, both the, the politicians and people in society, like the law was published, but it was it was a huge law. It was 170 pages in length. It was this huge omnibus legislation of like everything that the people, the liberals wanted to to basically take away from us all in one go. And it had to be passed right away because because terrorism. And so the that was one of the complaints at the time that like there's this huge change happening to our society, our laws, our country, 
And it's not that the terrorists made this change. It's our politicians are made this change all in one go and all because we were not really supposed to be critical at that time. And our critical reasoning skills kind of took a hit where we weren't really supposed to question whether or not uh, acting on terrorism was really a good idea. So anyway, quote, only the Social Dem Democratic New Democrat Party voted against the bill on the second re reading. It's worth pointing out that this is before Elizabeth May won her seat as a Green MP. She would later come out against anti-terror bills and anti-terror act related things like this. So continuing on. Uh, civil disobedience short of terrorism is addressed in other federal, provincial, and territorial legislation. It should not be caught by this bill, but of course it was. Quote, does this definition that was in the bill include protest activities by Aboriginal people which disrupt an, quote, essential service or block a road? That was probably directly in reference to the Oka crisis. Quote, as a protest against development activities on Aboriginal lands. At Burnt Church, protesters disrupted the use of highways and waterways to protest the lobster fishery and compelled the government to recognize an Aboriginal fishery. Were they terrorists? What about those involved with the recent nurses or truckers strikes? Or the protesters at the Quebec City Summit or the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Conference in Vancouver? What about the political activists who may have appeared as, quote, terrorists to those in power at a time who were ultimately remembered as champions of freedom, such as Louis Riel or Nelson Mandela? The bill criminalizes involvement or support of any sort of terrorist group, and all its property is frozen and subject to forfeiture. As far as getting an organization removed from the list of listed entities, while the applicant is, is to have a reasonable opportunity to be heard, the applicant may not know the allegations to which it must respond. And so the, basically what they're talking about there is charities. And so if you're running a charity that, as kind of mentioned a couple of shows ago, uh, helps people in Kashmir connect to the internet, or maybe you're helping Kashmir, people in Kashmir have access to fresh water. And then suddenly the government of Canada decides your group is a terrorist group. No, they don't have to tell you the evidence against you. Your group is just suddenly a terrorist group. It's listed in the, the list of terrorist groups. And everyone involved with it is now a terrorist and can be arrested and held. And it's a very serious uh, crime suddenly to be a member of this group. Going, Continuing on. We've also had roads blocked in rural parts of Canada by environmentalists preventing lumber companies from going into the forests. And again, some of these things that, that protests are, are doing, it's not very nice. And some of it may even be worth criminalizing. But is it terrorism is, is kind of the question. And should we be treating it as if it was terrorism? It, as if there's a moral equivalence of standing in a highway between farmers driving combines and pickup trucks to buy fertilizer as an act of protest, is that terrorism? Assuming, of course, they can just drive somewhere else and get fertilizer somewhere else. Is, is that the same thing as having strapping a bomb to your chest and blowing yourself up in a public place? This is the, what the law is treating as more or less equivalent. Continuing on, the scope of sections 8302 and 8304 in clause four prohibiting financing of terrorism is too broad. It, were, it would curtail fundraising on behalf of organizations if there is a possibility, a possibility doesn't mean that there is, but it's just a possibility that some of the money will go to groups fighting for the victims of oppressive regimes, even if the causes are legitimate and the regimes oppressive. Uh, Canadians who financially support foreign Aboriginal groups seeking recognitions of their rights are another example of those who would likely be guilty of this offense. Section 8303 appears so open-ended that it would encompass even rep legal representation to the benefit of those engaged in terrorist activities. So there's two important points here. Uh, this is, I think, all from a comment. Uh, but anyway, the first thing is that if you donate or fundraise for a listed entity, so let's let's say this this charity of yours, if you're just someone involved with fundraising, going door to door, asking people to to raise money to support Kashmiris and their access to fresh water or the internet, right? Suddenly you're a terrorist. You can go to jail and have secret evidence used against you in court. And if you are again, if you donate. So if you go door to door, every single person who said yes can suddenly go to jail and be held with secret evidence. This is what is on the laws as of 18 years ago now. This is this is the Canada we live in. This is the probably most one of the most important things that like should be at the top, near the top of our list of things that really need changing because this again was passed while people were freaking out about terrorism. 
And so anyway, continuing on. Why is there no criminal intent required? How can someone facilitate a terrorist activity if they are unaware that they have done anything or admitted to do something that facilitated terrorist activity? I.e., again, if you're just this little old lady in the middle of nowhere, Saskatchewan, raising money for victims of Kashmir government oppression, it doesn't matter that you're you're not doing so to hurt people or that you're doing that you're trying to raise this money to spread some radical version of Islam that involves killing people or something. It, it doesn't matter. All that matters is you fundraise for an illegal group or you support an illegal group or you're a member of an illegal group and boom, you're a terrorist. So continuing on, the, confense, the offense is committed even if a group does not actually carry out a terrorist activity, not even like, so again, the, the group doesn't have to commit any actual terrorism, any acts of violence, any acts of political, uh, economic, or anything. Just the government doesn't like you. Uh, you're, you're not liberal enough, or you're not Trumpist enough, or what? who knows who's going to get in power in the future in Canada, and what they're going to see as their enemy. Like the, the Yellow Jackets, the, the, the Occupy. The, this power shouldn't even have been available at all to groups like Occupy. But even if like some group like Occupy took over parliament and managed to like institute some kind of like people's government or, or people's party, unlike the current people's party, right? Or, or here, here's another one, like it is people who believe in climate change, right? Groups like Greenpeace. There are plenty of conservatives who think that Greenpeace should be listed as a terrorist organization. And this law allows that to happen, and then once that happens, all the people who donate to terror or to Greenpeace are now terrorists and can be arrested, held without the evidence against them being available to their legal team, etc. Continuing on, the offense is committed even if a group does not actually carry out a terrorist activity. The participation or contribution of the accused does not actually enhance the group's ability to facilitate or carry out a terrorist activity. I.e., you don't even have to help them; you just have to try to help. Continuing on, or the accused did not know the specific nature of the activity that may be facilitated or carried out, i.e. like you're raising, even like if you suppose that the group that you're raising money for actually uses the money for violence and killing people or something, you're not knowing about it doesn't, doesn't add anything to, you, to your defense at all. It's just, you're still a terrorist, too bad. Continuing on. The wording is so broad that it could include contributions to an organization that in turn contributes to an organization with links to terrorism. So not only would Greenpeace, if they made Greenpeace the listed entity, if would you get in trouble for donating to Greenpeace? But if your organization donated to Greenpeace, then suddenly your organization is basically in trouble and can be shut down and can have the government arrest everyone involved. And so who as organizations contribute to Greenpeace? maybe Ducks Unlimited, I mean, as much as I don't like them, like, have they ever donated to Greenpeace? Uh, do they ever work on mutual projects with other or charities? Who works with Greenpeace, right? There are the Sierra Club, perhaps, even if, if they only take out one of these, uh, these organizations, one of these NGOs, it, there's groups like that usually work with other groups. And so like, this is a, a tool in law that allows the government to just go into a, a group of people that it doesn't like and just, again, start arresting people. And it's it's pretty pretty up there. So continuing on. The, any Canadians originate from countries where they have been, there, where there have been divisive political struggles for decades, perhaps in which they themselves have directly suffered. We question whether our government should dictate which side of such struggles are defensible and which are not, and whether Canadians can offer support as their own consciences and experiences dictate i.e. if there's a civil war in a country and one side gains control of that country, like let's say Syria, and then suddenly the, the losers of that struggle basically get called terrorists. That's what happens is in civil wars a lot of the time uh, is the, the losers wind up, wind up being criminalized. And so now that the Canadian government is going to take the Syrian government's word of who is and is not a terrorist. Now, granted, there are terrorists in Syria, the, the al Islamias, they're terrible, terrible people in that, 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 that state, that government, that whatever you want to call it, that should be face legal problems in Canada. But at the same time, there's probably freedom fighters out there too, of some kind, before they were all slaughtered, I'm sure. But anyway, continuing on. It is important to bear in mind that C-36 would not only capture 
potential perpetrators of acts similar to those we have recently witnessed, i.e. 9-11, it would encompass a wide variety of political dissidents, some who might eventually resort to violent and destructive behavior, but others who would not. We must recognize the bill's potential to go too far and impact disproportionately religious, racial, and ethnic minorities, i.e. mandatory cumulative sentences, think South Africa and Nelson Mandela, which is another important point is that the sentences that you would get for being a member of a terrorist group and participating in a terrorist activity and a fundraising and all these sorts of things, they stack. And so you can get an 80 year or 50 year or whatever sentence for doing these sorts of things. And the it's a mandatory minimum sentence. So this is, again, the conservatives have tended to like this, but it's important to note the liberals have done this too. And the liberals have in the laws here in Canada uh, put mandatory mini minimums in place, which are routinely denounced as unjust in, in legal circles. And so, and, and another point, again, Nelson Mandela would have been seen it, as a terrorist in his country at the time that he was engaged in political dissonance. And the sentence for what he was doing was to be locked up in a basically solitary confinement for a long time, right? So that, again, is what they changed the laws in Canada to allow is the next person of that caliber, that moral caliber, and the next peaceful protester who just happens to stand on a street uh, could very well find himself sitting in solitary for the rest of his life, which again, solitary being basically torture. Continuing on, breaches, it also breaches client solicitor privilege by having terrorist property turned over without exception to client solicitor privilege, i.e. if you have letters to your lawyer, normally those sorts of things would have been kept from the government, but since 9-11, that's the sort of thing that the government can just sort of seize. They can take your property, again, without telling you why, without giving you the evidence, without allowing your, you to communicate safely with the lawyer. All these sorts of things are, are things that are important in free societies, but we lack here in Canada, especially when terrorism is involved. Continuing on, the new investigative techniques provided by C-36 are substantial departures from what has been so far considered acceptable in Canada. And again, this is not including mass surveillance. This all, the mass surveillance started around this period of time, but the we weren't told about it. And so there were things that were and weren't acceptable to Canadian citizens at the time, but quote, the mechanisms of preventive arrest and of investigative hearing involve departures which are serious and full of consequence. The involvement of the judiciary and police in investigative activities brings judges closer to the inquisitorial role so problematic in other ju jurisdictions. The right to silence during investigative phase has long been seen as fundamental to the rights of individuals. Again, you don't have the right to silence anymore. You do not, if you are told by police, you have the right to remain silent. It's not true. Not in Canada. They can compel you to talk. Continuing on, the right to silence during the investigative phase has long been seen as fundamental to the rights of in the individual, and the investigative hearing would do away with it. The preventative arrest mechanism, i.e., they just feel like arresting you and then they take you. Expose you, expose the citizens to arrest and detention before any charges are laid against anyone. As, even assuming such radical departures to be necessary for a time, some aspect of the proposed mechanisms deserve attention prior to the bill being passed. They later, they did have some of this as part of a sunset clause, but it was renewed. So anyway, continuing on. There is no requirement that the police officer reasonably believe that danger is imminent. I there's no ticking time bomb argument that's relevant here, which which is the, the argument that was usually used at the time, basically saying that suppose that there's a terrorist about to attack, let's say, Ottawa, and they put a bomb somewhere in Ottawa, and it's a big bomb, it's going to kill lots of people. The bomb is ticking, it's going to go off. And so what is justified in your, you, you've arrested the guy, you know who's planted the bomb, uh, but what can you do to, to get this guy to talk? And is, this is usually how torture is, justified. This is what Canada did is better than torture. We did not legalize torture in this country. We could have. We could have easily done that. There were certainly movements in the world at that time with Guantanamo Bay. This is before, of course, Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib became public. So people generally in Canada would have been against torture being legalized. And people even in the States would have just been like abhorred. Like it, it, it just would not have made sense to legalize torture, but we could have. That was something that was there. And there was no secret laws 
on the books. At least to my knowledge, the, this is really part of the rule of law is being able to have the legal right to have access to the laws that govern you. And so before 2001, there, there really wasn't in Canada any secret laws that I'm aware of, at least worth mentioning. So continuing on. Oh, sorry. But so uh, according to C-36, though, uh, they can arrest you even though there's no danger. So there's no bomb. There's no justification for arresting someone with a, without trial or without charge or without suspicion even. It's just uh, we feel like arresting you and that's now okay. Which is, uh, again, something I kind of want to point out. Uh, a video came out this week. I'm probably going to talk a little bit more about this video. But it was basically showing, uh, or what had happened was here in Saskatoon, uh, there was a bunch of Native kids who were about to be arrested or being hassled in some way, shape, or form. And so a third party intervened. And the third party intervened by pointing out that the, the cops didn't have the right to just go through their, their possessions and arrest them without because they're Native, basically. But again... According to C-36, they can be arrested and held without charge, without suspicion that they're going to be danger or they have done anything dangerous. All they have to say is that it's terrorism related, and boom, the whole group of kids can be arrested without trial, without charge, nothing, just because they're natives. Again, officially, on paper, it would be because they're terrorists, but there's no justification required to do this. That is what this law allows the government and the police to do. It allows their racism that exists to to be basically weaponized and used against minority groups in Saskatoon. That means natives and Filipinos. And so, again, it's a really dangerous thing to have on the books to be able. This, this person was obviously unaware that this law exists and that was passed 18 years ago. Maybe she's too young. Maybe she doesn't remember. I don't know. I have a feeling I'm going to run across her one of these days. She's She runs in similar circles, so... Uh, we'll see what happens then. But anyway, continuing on. We note that the investigative hearings in C-36 could be used against journalists, forcing them to disclose information that they collect and to reveal their sources and work without an ongoing proceeding to determine the necessity of revealing that source, i.e., the government can just say, well, we don't like you investigating this oil spill, so you're now involved in a terrorist investigation. We're going to seize all your property, and all your sources are going to be revealed. And so now nobody is going to if they were aware of this, would at least, at least people would be a little bit more hesitant to talk to journalists and say things unrelated to terrorism because they know that the journalists' materials can be just taken from them. And unless there's some active technical means of preventing you from being identified, something like Secure Drop, which wasn't invented until like a decade later, then maybe you shouldn't talk to journalists if you're not 100% sure that you're okay with what you're telling them getting out in public, including who you are. So things like, for example, if there is a, oh, I don't know, what's the, uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. Anyway, continue on. Many sources will provide information only on the basis that their identity will not be disclosed. They fear the repercussions that may flow from disclosure, including victimization and physical harm. I, if you want to end journalism in Canada, having a, the government be able to peel into everyone's sources would be a good way to do it. Quote, in Goodwin versus the United Kingdom, the 13, or 13, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that the protection of journalistic sources was one of the basic conditions of press freedom, i.e. C-36, the Anti-Terrorist Act of 2001, ended the press freedom in Canada. We really don't have press freedom in this country, and it is vitally important to the future of our democracy that we get it back, that we prevent the government from just willy-nilly having the power to force journalists to reveal their sources, that we allow journalism to exist in Canada. Never mind this discussion of fake news. Never mind the, the Justin Trudeau's freaking propaganda funding of you know, hundreds of whatever million of dollars to the mainstream media and main quote-unquote news sources. And never mind uh, whether or not we should fund CBC. Being able to be allowed to have journalists in our country that can actually do journalism, including having sources that the government can't just take from them and materials and papers that the government can't just demand of them under threat of throwing away for terrorism. That is the important part. That should be the issue number one in this election that we are currently in. That should be the issue we are willing to go to the voting booth for to get back. 
this is what Canada should be, where we should be focusing our attention, is on these anti-terrorist bills that prevent us from solving other problems. Because things like the environment, we I've talked to so many people who are just ignorant, who are just disconnected from the environment in which they live, and that are having trouble because the institutions in their life that they get information from are failing them, that there is no news sources in Thunder Bay other than maybe the Chronicle Journal, which fails their readers. There is no journalistic sources in Saskatoon that can be safe from this sort of thing. And we are suffering as a result. We need to have better journalism in this country. We need to, as a society, figure a way to reward journalists and to have a steady supply of people investigating and digging into our lives so that we can actually solve the problems in our society through understanding them better. But we can't do this unless journalists are allowed to work. And this right here, this is one of the important things worth pointing out. So continuing on, non-disclosure of security information under the Canada Evidence Act, quote, it leads to the tautological reasoning that, quote, we say you're a terrorist, we have evidence that you're a terrorist, but in the interest of national security, we'll not show you the evidence, take our word for it, i.e., the government of Canada can basically pull what the United States did in at t versus Hepting, where they can just arrest you, or they shut down your, your charity group or your business, or, or or organization or whatever, and they can say, well, you're a terrorist. And when you challenge it in court, they will say, well, we can't go into the details because of national security. And that's where the discussion ends. And uh, again, go, go to AT&T versus Hepting. It's, it's obscene and absurd how like, just how easy it is for the, the government, at least in the States, and here in Canada the same way, to, to get away with making that argument. But that is what the laws in Canada say. And the only way we are going to fix this is to A, remove the liberals from power, because the liberals are the source of this bullshit, to remove the conservatives from power, because they supported this and put forward another bill just like it about 10 years or 15 or whatever years later, and get the NDP in power or someone who is willing to take a stand to fix these gaping holes in our rule of law, in our ability to live in a free country. Continuing on, non-disclosure non of use of anti-terror provisions to the privacy commissioner, i.e. they were able to do things like create a mass surveillance system and not tell the rest of the government, i.e. the representatives of the people of Canada, that it was going on A in their name, B with their money, C with their, their officials and uh, employees of the government, in, probably D contractors on top of that. So. And my point here is that at the time we used to have a functioning privacy commissioner, there were a bunch of scandals in the 1980s and early 1990s where like the Canadian and US governments got caught doing, well, actually in the 70s too, uh, basically they got caught doing really bad things like planting bombs and spying on people and like not mass surveillance spying, but like spying on people in clearly, never mind illegal, but just like utterly wrong ways. And things like Watergate happened, and the the plumbers involved in that. Like there there were there were lots of examples, of, and there was a freakout that happened. And one of the things we got out of that is a privacy commissioner here in Canada that was supposed to basically act and advocate on behalf of the right to privacy and the the right to private life here in Canada for Canadian citizens. And when the privacy commissioner acted. Uh, one of the things it would do would be to basically analyze what the government in Canada was doing with our private information and whether or not it was acting responsibly with it. So, for example, they would have freaked out in 2001 if they had known that Canada was building a mass surveillance system. That would have been slapped down hard, and the privacy commissioner at that time had both the funding to do the research and to determine the scope of a problem and figure out what, whether it was illegal or not. And then two, it also had some power to like just shut things down like that. Unfortunately, C-36 allowed the creation of activity in the, in the Canadian government to go on without the privacy commissioner having access to the information of what was going on. So it'll, it created this space, the beginnings of secret laws, the uh, beginnings of government activity that was not in any way, shape, or form, beholden to the democratic will of the people in Canada. Continuing on, whether the eternal the attorney general had exercised the certificate power reasonably, end quote, i.e., they, at that point, the, the certificate power, as mentioned kind of before, was broadly expanded. 
And so the privacy commissioner should have been able to analyze how much these certificates were being used, whether or not they were being used appropriately, how much personal information was being taken, et cetera. Continuing on. So it goes on to show, yeah, so like this is where secret laws start in Canada, where up until this point you could, I mean, even if you weren't a lawyer, you could hire a lawyer and say, here, I want you to, to find out the law I'm being charged with and is it actually a law or is it just something they're making up? And up until this point, you would be able to find it. And you, you as a, a citizen could ask your elected representative to, to look at the law, to, to make decisions about it. Whereas now, like we can't even really know what our government is doing. We can't know how many times these certificates are being used. We can't know how many people are being arrested or whatever on this. On this, like, never mind the the broad statistics of the aggregate, it's stats can or the uh, criminal uh, justice system. Not, none of that stuff. Just like the basic understanding of what exactly are we building here? Quote. And so they were also at the time worried about the privacy of foreign communications. They, they weren't even talking about mass surveillance at all. They weren't talking about domestic surveillance, certainly not domestic mass surveillance. That was unthinkable. They were like, the, the Canadian Bar Association at the time was worried about the rights of foreigners as individuals to communicate securely and privately in Canada. This is the sort of thing that was starting to come under fire. So, quote, up until 2001, the media had the right to report on what they heard in courtrooms. But this bill seeks to restrict and further freedom of expression and freedom of the press. It seeks to curtail public scrutiny of administration of justice by preventing the publication of identities of all individuals involved in proceedings. Predicted consequence was, quote, a hostile foreign government or entity may manipulate the information. I think I have this somewhat backwards. Anyway, a uh, long story short, it's it, it just it, it was a restriction on the freedom of the press, and it seems to be like kind of picked out of the blue, and it doesn't seem like there was any justification for it. Anyway, continuing, a hostile foreign government or entity may manipulate the information to harm a charitable organization, especially where there is religious hostility. The charity would be left defenseless. So can you imagine the Trumpist or the Trump government in the States ever designating a peaceful group of protesters as terrorists or a peaceful group, again, like Greenpeace or, oh, I don't know, who does, who does Trump have a hard on against? Uh, let's say the Clinton Foundation, they'd never like declare them a terrorist, could they? If Trump had the power to do that, would we here in Canada have to follow suit? That's the sort of thing that C36 allows. Anyway, in addition to the Canadian Bar Association, there's also a, an article I have here from the World Socialist website, which I think I, I have talked about a little bit. So it, it talks about this bill a little bit, so kind of relevant parts are, quote, a catch-all this definition of terrorist act. Until now, there was a concept of a terrorist act has been used in Canada only in the Immigration Act. Immigration officials had the right to expel or deny entry to non-Canadians suspected of terrorist involvement in a terrorist act. One reason is that the Justice Department officials found it impossible to come up with a definition of terrorism that they were confident could withstand a court challenge and didn't catch all manner of unrelated acts of dissonance within its ambit. Another, or another is that the criminal code already contains severe legal penalties for anyone who commits the offenses usually associated with terrorism, assassinations, bombings, plane hijackings, etc. Pause. This is where, like, if, if you want to, like, see where this leads, Noam Chomsky's kind of argument against this is great, which is that he actually finds the definition the U.S. government uses about what is and is not terrorism, and then, like, goes point by point by point in noticing that the U.S. government itself is a terrorist group. And, like, they totally are, like, under under that definition, like it's, it's undeniable. And so pretty much if, if you go to the, what the Canadian government defines, like you're gonna get stuff like different religious groups accusing each other of terrorism, right? So continuing. Now, however, the Croatian government has established under a catch-all rubric of terrorist act, a new order of expressly political crimes, which to which the normal limits on state power will no longer apply. Those convicted of the more severe of the terrorist acts face an automatic 25 life or 25 year jail sentence. The C36 begins by listing some 35 offenses taken from 10 international agreements and protocols liable to be defined as terrorist acts. Then in a second section, it further defines a terrorist act as an act of omissions in or outside Canada that is committed dot 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 for political, religious, or ideological purpose and that is aimed at causing any of the following, death or injury, substantial property damage, quote unquote, if the probable result is to place people's safety at risk, or quote, cause serious interference with seri or serious disruption of an essential service. Pause. Now remember, 
In Saskatchewan, essential service means donuts. If you, as an individual, block people from getting Robin's donuts, you are a terrorist. Continuing on, facility or system, whether public or private. Pause, I'm not kidding. That's actually in our laws here in Saskatchewan, that the Robin's Donuts, one of the Robin's Donuts at least, is considered an essential service. And again, if that means that if you block it as a part of a protest, you are a terrorist in Canada. And you can be locked away for probably 25 years and have secret evidence used against you in court that you can be arrested without charge, that people who are in the same organization as you maybe can all be charged with terrorists or as terrorists, that you can be denied access to a lawyer, you can be held again without charge, continuing on. The last clause is particularly om ominous, since it in another subclause that mentions threats to Canadians, quote, economic security, can be used to smear work stoppages, blockades, and other acts of civil disobedience as, quote, terrorism, and thus threaten participate, er, participants with massive legal sanctions, i.e. your strikes. Your strikes can be considered terrorism. This is why, again, if you're serious about labor rights and working for something other than maybe minimum wage or less than minimum wage, you want to have unions in your life in some level or some way, shape, or form. Or if you're not willing to have unions in your life, that you're at least willing to work with your fellow co-workers to do stuff like wildcat strikes, to stop work, to work with your fellow workers to make it so that you, the person in control of the workplace is the person who actually does the work. And so when we're, we're looking at whether or not we should be changing these laws, the reason we should be changing, one of the main reasons we should be changing them is because it criminalizes labor activity. It criminalizes union organizing. Continuing on, the government's definition of a terrorist act does does go on specifically to exclude legal strikes and protests, but only if they don't aim to seriously disrupt an essential service. Again, look at the Saskatchewan government and how broadly they've taken that essential services legislation and threw it everywhere. Continuing on, moreover, by explicitly excluding, quote, legal strikes, uh, that is, those that conform with the battery of repressive labor laws from uh, its ambit. C-36 ex implicitly classifies strikes mounted in defiance of such laws and that disrupt public services or the country's economy, quote, terrorist acts, i.e. wildcat strikes are terrorism. This is from Wikipedia, quote, some of the bill's provisions were set to expire on March 1st, 2007. The Harper government urged that these should be renewed, while all three opposition parties were opposed. Freaking flip-flopping liberals. Enough. It, it was... It was totally fine when they were in power, right? But when they're not in power, it was just used as a political game. Anyway, continuing on. Specifically, the provisions had to do with preventative arrest and investigative hearings. On February 28, 2007, the House voted against renewing these provisions, which later led to their expiry. However, in 2012, the Government of Canada introduced to the Senate uh, of Canada Bill S-7, the Combating Terrorist Act, which was for to renew the re expired provisions for a new five-year term and introduce new crimes for leaving Canada to join or train with a terror group. The bill also increased maximum prison sentences for some offenses related to harboring terrorists or suspected terrorists. Again, when you read, quote, suspected terrorist, you should be thinking, mm, Clinton Foundation or Greenpeace or, mm, let's say, I don't know, who's your favorite group, uh, quote, I don't know. Anyway, continuing. On April 19th, just after the Boston Marathon bombing, the government rearranged the parliamentary agenda to fast-track Bill S-7 to vote on April 22 or 23, 2013. The act received royal assent on April 15, 2013. So again, this is like right as I'm leaving Regina that this stuff is still going on, dating all the way back to 2001. So again, this is why. Like, why am I spending so much time on this ancient bill, this bill from like 10 years ago? Well, it's it still has provisions that... Yes, they were for a little while defeated, but they came back and they're still on the books and the liberal government has not gotten rid of them because why would they? This is a liberal law. This is what li living in a liberal Canada means, is to have your rights taken away, to be arrested without trial, to be charged for being a peaceful protester and a member of a group that does charity work, that to be charged with terrorism for giving funds to charity, for being charged with terrorism for not supporting violent acts, but for engaging in labor action or a wildcat strike to try to get a better wage, maybe, to try to 
have a working living wage, to try to live with some kind of uh, decency or human decency as a, a, a worker, uh, a, a, as someone who does a important job for the country that they live in. It is about Bitcoin. Bitcoin was basically, when we start looking at the government's coming down to clamp on Bitcoin, there is stuff in the Anti-Terrorist Act of 2001 to clamp down on people who use financial transactions. And when we look at the, the cryptocurrency markets and the, the, the exchanges where like you, they basically are forced by the Canadian government to spy on their customers and, and on Bitcoin users specifically, it dates to this law. We lost so much when this law passed. And again, it was because there, we were afraid to be critical of our government at a time when everyone was freaking out. Continuing on. Also part of the context was the Quebec, Quebec City at the Summit of the Americas. Quote, what is lawful? Lawful sounds good, but a lot of young people thought they were engaged in lawful protest in Quebec City, way beyond the perimeter. I, they basically, the same thing they did in uh, G20 in Toronto, where they like closed the entire downtown of the city, uh, or at least part of the, I don't know how, where downtown ends. But anyways, a, a huge area in downtown Toronto. And then if you were doing something in that perimeter, inside that area, then you were really in trouble but uh, it was outside of the perimeter. You were just like in the middle of the city somewhere in Quebec. And they thought that they were peacefully protesting and the cops came in and gassed and beat up everyone, right? Quote, so continuing on, they were just sitting around talking to each other when all of a sudden they were tear gassed, fired upon with rubber bullets and treated as if they were doing something unlawful. And like including even, even stuff like uh, tear gas and wh whatever, just like when we think of, well, this isn't gonna impact me because I'm a law abiding citizen and if I go protest, I'm going to be peaceful, and I, it's not like I'm doing anything illegal. Well, again, the government has a different idea of what so the, hopefully illegal the is going, going to be. be a little bit better now. Uh, so uh, when they decide to point to my old mic for doing this, you might be in for a little bit of a surprise. Continuing on, here, the African National Congress, in its fight against a brutal like and racist this. apartheid regime in South Africa, uh, would clearly have been caught by this legislation as would any Canadians who supported That's going to be the ANC in its okay. fight against apartheid. Now, without so further ado, this is a, a, a good point. There were people in Canada at the time that were opposed to apartheid. And apartheid has, over time, been removed yeah, because it's it's among a peaceful protest. By the and and did they, they solve all the problems in their country? I did they, did they, are, is, is South Africa today the, the greatest place in the world where like, everyone's living in peace and harmony? No, but was there a really good court. thing that happened when apartheid was removed and people there, started being treated by their government as kind of equal in a fundamental well, way? Yeah, actually, it was, it was, it was, it was not something we should be penalizing people in Canada like for helping in other places. Through. If, for example, you buy Hell, that Israel, of it is wrong. That we are seeing the birth of the or hearing something more like that is happening, then again, this makes it a crime in Canada to to do the things that well, Canada grew up quick and I grew up leave to my hacking got back hard and I wish got in Israel. Same thing in our reserve system. Like, name. when we look at apartheid and Israel and how they the kind of the manage their minority population, the how they built fall. their model and how, what they modeled their country on, what they had. Got so, the people who protest the reserve well, system, the the system the again, the law on the books as it stands is yes, they would. So, in the debates in the open government, the, the crap, the conservative reform alliance the cafe, even admitted that the conservatives, the table, citizens, were revolting against the bill. But people RIA understood in Canada, uh, at least the keener is how well, bad an idea was. And it's still so supporting it, which is worth pointing out. I have a link to it here. I'm going to post it this video. I think, however, this video has been going kind of long enough. So, anyway, if you like this video, if you got some Well, first of all, this is an election a good call, Tell your, said, the people running for your bands, how you're not going to vote for them unless you do something about The barrage of anti-terrorist bills so have right been fast the over the past 20 years in this country. And that they should actually right start fixing up, the lack of rule of law in this country. Hand. And things like basic press freedom right should be fundamental protected in a fundamental way in this country. And we I should have the right to try. We should be able to face our people. We should be able to see the evidence against us. And that we shouldn't just be 
as the rest of you about to move in Saskatoon, as I mentioned, just like swept up and arrested because we're the wrong ethnic group, the wrong minority group, the wrong political political persuasion, and arrested and held without charge for seven days or longer. These are not things that should be happening in Canada. They are not things that should be that our government should be allowed to do. This is something we should be fixing. This is an important thing we should be devoting our attention to. It should still be in our newspapers. When we have newspapers like the Star Phoenix, the Journal, and there isn't every issue something about, okay, you know, we still have these anti-terror laws. They're still on the books. We haven't gotten rid of them. We still don't live in a place. Then, again, this is a problem. We should... Keep at it. Keep hammering on it. Keep bringing it up. You said, no, you just fought one hell of a fight. Yes. Anti-terrorist act of 2001 is in effect in Canada. It has been used. It has been targeted on fairly far. Hundreds of people have been brought up on bullshit charges. It's still awful. It's still a problem. It is something that still has to be fixed. Again, it's an election time. We have the chance to choose to do something about it. One of the things you can do is to vote NDP. Vote Green. If you're on a writing like Thunder Base Carrier, no. Vote Green. Because the Green Party will also do something like this. But even if internal to the Liberal and Conservative parties, you can still get pressure on their representatives. Maybe because it's an election time, they're listening. They're paying a little bit of attention. Maybe they'll try to vote. Maybe they'll only say they'll do something, but that's better than where we are now. So yeah, go out and do that. Uh, and the other thing, too, is if you soul, like this broadcast, and if you want to more things like it, we're going to keep going one way or the other for a while. But it would certainly be nice to have a little So put my subscribers to it, or, or villages, or wherever else, jail. send me a, a dime or something. It would be nice to have some feedback and some kind of financial fund that I'm doing the right thing here. So, in any case, this broadcast has gone on a lot. I think about it now, every time I see young Right, stuff that's free, and if I ever have a son, I think I'm going to teach him to fight the corporations from a legal and political standpoint. So he.